Hello and welcome to another episode of Proactive Parenting, a show where I offer judgment-free advice on how to raise value-driven kids in a way that's right for your family using the most current scientific research out there. I'm your host, Dr. Deanna Marie Mason. I'm a certified nurse practitioner, published author, and expert in child development. I'm also a mom of two fabulous teenage kids, and I know firsthand how much pressure and misinformation is out there. That's why I'm here to help. So grab a cup of tea and settle in and let's let our guards down a bit because this is a safe space to ask questions and get real honest answers about how to raise kids in a way that works for you. So today's episode is actually inspired by a listener's email to me about the difference between her three children. She had explained to me in her email that she was really confused about why her two older children kind of pass through all of these developmental milestones at one age, but her youngest seems to be really far behind. And she was curious about why that would be and what she could do. And while her issue um, is, is specific to their family, I know that this question comes up a lot in my work with other families that why kids don't do things at exactly the same age when they live in the same home with the same parents doing the same things. And I thought that that would be a great place for today's podcast to focus on the difference between chronological age and developmental age. So what is chronological age? super easy. It's the number of birthdays that our child has had. We measure it in months when they're infants. We measure it in years when they get older. Super easy to measure. It's very helpful. It marks milestones like the first birthday, when to start school, when you can drive, when you can vote. Very easy. Developmental age is a little bit more complex to say the least. Developmental age is a embodied view of the child that takes into account their chronological age, but also lots of other variables. For example, it takes into account their character, their personal preferences, their past experiences, their current situation, their development in a whole bunch of different areas, such as physical, emotional, intellectual, social, when they get uh, older in the tweens, and teenage years, sexual maturation, there's moral maturation, there's lots of areas that come into developmental age. And it can't be reduced down to simply a number with an expectation of behaviors at that number. I don't want to diminish the importance of chronological age because in many ways, that's how society defines children's progress through childhood and adolescence and grants privileges to them based on that chronological age. But from a parenting perspective, the chronological age is not the sole defining characteristic of what we should allow our child to do. Instead, I advocate for parents to use developmental age, but not just one developmental age, but looking at their child in each aspect and ascribing that child's developmental age in each area. When we look at development, and I'll use a case similar to the the listener that wrote in, we can have a child who is chronologically 13 years of age. And when we start to place that child's development in different areas on a scale, we might find that that child in physical development is closer to 15 or 16 years of age because of physical height, sexual maturation, so on and so forth. But emotionally, that child might be working at closer to a 10 or 11 year old age in terms of how they can handle stressful situations how they can self-calm when there's difficulties, their perseverance to sit through an uncomfortable situation. 
they might be a little bit behind their chronological age in emotional development while ahead in their physical development. If their emotional development is behind, generally that means that their social development is also behind. And so as a parent, it's very easy to look at the 13 year old and say, well, you should be doing these things right now because you look on the ex external part of you to be very mature, but fail to recognize that developmentally on the emotional and social level, their child just is not ready for some group activities with peers and can't handle some independence in certain situations because they become overwhelmed when conflict or difficulties arrive. And I think that answer is a great way for you to understand the importance of developmental age in how to parent. So when we have families with multiple siblings and parents are used to one child's developmental age or de developmental progression, excuse me, happening on a certain timeline, it can be hard to flex to other children's needs. But that doesn't mean it's not important because every child is born with an internal character, personality, sensitivity, they have their own personal preferences. They have their past experiences and see themselves in a current situation. And when I talk about this with very small children, it generally refers to birth order. We know that children who are born first generally speak earlier than youngest born children. Why is that? There's a simple answer. First born children have no one to speak for them. If they want to communicate with parents or caregivers, they have to to do the effort of speaking, where younger siblings have older siblings to do the translation or speaking for them, so they generally speak later. So when I talk about past experience, birth order becomes uh, a variable in there that influences developmental age. There's also something else about developmental age that I like to point out to parents and I'd like to share here, which is we often become very focused on our child's external developmental milestones, the things that they're showing us that they can do externally, whether that is sit up, walk, talk, cut with the scissors, draw a circle, ride a bike, throw a ball, drive um, as they go through the whole developmental cycle. We get really hung up on those. However, it's important that we also pay attention to the internal mechanisms that have to happen first before that child can display those external behaviors. And those internal changes are as important to their progress as that final skill that shows itself externally. So if you've listened to other podcasts, you, you've noticed that I talk a lot about managing emotions. And that is one of those internal characteristics that we need to help our children learn to manage so that they can progress in other areas externally. And there's really no external behavior that shows that. We only know that they have control of their emotions later when we see them in social interactions, when we see them become resilient, when we see them overcome anxiety and put themselves in situations that are difficult or pick themselves up from a failure. But the internal process of recognizing that they have an emotion, recognizing that that emotion may be difficult, finding coping mechanisms to manage it so that it doesn't impede their progress, these are all things that are happening inside that we as parents need to help guide our children learn to do so that they can go ahead and use that skill in their pursuit of other skills. For example, if a child does not know how to manage their frustration that comes with failure, it can impede their ability to learn to ride a bike ultimately because after falling down a few times, the frustration of that failure can become so overwhelming that it blocks them from their desire to ride the bike. The desire to ride the bike is less 
than their desire to avoid that uncomfortable situation or that feeling that comes with those repeated failures in the beginning. And what that means is they just leave it aside and they just decide not to ride the bike. And the issue isn't that they don't want to ride the bike or that they don't think bike riding would be fun or that they don't want to join their friends riding bikes. It's that emotionally they don't have the ability to overcome that frustration. And so if we take a couple steps back and we focus on managing frustration, building up resilience, looking at process rather than execution and praising children for the, for the effort rather than the outcome, we can help our child learn to overcome those difficult feelings and persist in an activity until they master it. The other great thing that happens when we focus on a child's developmental age and not just their chronological age is that we can figure out where they're at because every child, regardless of who they are, must go through a predictable and progressive process of development in a predetermined order to become an adult. They begin the process on the day that they're born and they're obliged to follow it until they have achieved adulthood. It is virtually impossible to skip or omit any step in this developmental journey because each skill or ability is the building block for later skills and ability. So when we're lost with our child about what is going on inside of them, we simply start marking their developmental age to find out where they're at because if they're not progressing, they're stuck someplace. We just need to go back and find out where they're stuck, identify why they're stuck, and then support them so they can continue forward. What we can't do, which is what happens sometimes when we only look at chronological age, is expect them to jump forward to where they should be. It's just impossible. They don't have the right building blocks to go where we want them to be. We need to go back and we need to help them restart in the areas where they're behind. That's it. And so it's going to really change how we parent when we focus on developmental age rather than just chronological age. Because that developmental age in those distinct areas becomes a lighthouse to guide your approach and relationship with your child. I cannot explain the power there is in using your child's development to to navigate and manage the task of being a parent and handling all of the issues and insecurities that are inherently arise. And you're going to understand the significance and power of this once you've seen the amazing results that it brings. In looking at developmental age versus chronological age, it's important to remember that there's no comparison here. Every child has a beautifully unique character and personality that shines from the moment that they're born. We all know some people have babies that are very reactive and sensitive and they cry a lot and other people have babies that are super relaxed and chill. And I just want to let you know that there is no child that is better or worse or easier or harder to parent. There's really not as long as we adapt our parenting style to reflect the personality and character of that unique child, we can guide them with little to no friction. And also remember that your little one's experiences and current situation also influence their developmental age and how to parent them. Just for example, if your family has gone through a restructuring due to divorce or remarriage, or the arrival of a new sibling, or maybe you've had to relocate, or perhaps you're, as we are right now, in the middle of a global pandemic. Things have changed, and that's gonna influence how we parent. But I wanna reiterate that these situations aren't good or bad for your child. They just represent another factor that is going to influence how you continue to raise and nurture them in addition to their character and personality. So I want to give you a couple examples of chronological age and developmental age so you understand how this can be really powerful to you as a parent. Let's say, for example, you have a son who is 13 years old. 
chronologically. But his physical development is far ahead of that. He has a beard, very tall, broad shoulders, going through sexual development, and he looks more like 16 than 13. And because of that large body and height, he is recruited by sports teams because he has a physical advantage over other children of his chronological age. But simultaneously, this boy with a very mature physical appearance has a emotional development of around 11. What that means is he's really not into social peer norming yet. He is still looking at close friends and family for referencing and going along with peer groups are uncomfortable because he's not sure how to manage all the different pressures and conflicts that happen in group function yet. And he might draw back from working in group things that include sport, even though he's physically ready to engage in those types of activities because he has an advantage. Emotionally, he's not ready for the frustrations that come with missing a shot, feeling the pressure of the group on him and the expectation. And that can then socially push him back to to an earlier age, also around 10 or 11, where he starts avoiding large social circles, instead prefers to be on his own doing individual activities or only with small groups of close friends. And as a parent, from the outside, seeing this large 13-year-old boy, it may be very confusing why he's not taking advantage of these offers of um, being on teams or enjoying being a superstar on a team because of his physical advantage if we don't take a look at that emotional piece and the related social piece. Similarly, a girl who is 15 15 years old might not have reached Menarch yet. She might not have started her period yet. So she's still growing very tall. She's very thin, but she hasn't started to develop sexually. And her height, which is now, you know, having very narrow hips and having being a very tall, slender person is very fashionable. She might feel pressure from her peers to dress in a more provocative way or in current styles that don't yet address her true sexual maturation because her body is inside is still a little girl. She still doesn't have that hormonal change to make her think about her external appearance. And yet society all around her is telling her that she has the perfect body to have these very body conscious clothing and she can be attractive to the opposite sex where in her sexual development, she's not there yet. And that pressure can be confining. So her physical chronological age and her sexual development can be at crosshairs and put her in situations that make her uncomfortable and give people expectations about what she should be rather than letting her go through that process of exploration that's common in adolescence. So as a parent, if we can take a step back from our child's chronological age and start to look at them in terms of their development in different areas, it can really help us fine tune how we approach issues with them. It can help us understand their perspective more. And more importantly, it can avoid us from trying to push them forward into something that they're not ready to. Now on the other side, we can have children that are capable, but just not doing what they're supposed to. And this also is a benefit for looking at the developmental age versus chronological age. If we have a child that Monday through Friday cannot get out of bed, get dressed, eat breakfast, and be out the door on time for school, But on Saturday, when it's sports day, they can be up showered with their bag ready and packed and saying, mom, we're going to be late. We know that this child is choosing not to maximize their development. 
It's not, there's not a delay there that's holding them back. It is a purposeful choice on their part. And that can be very helpful with limits and discipline, which we'll talk about in another podcast. But by being able to evaluate where your child's developmental level is and marking their developmental age in relation to their physical, emotional, social, moral, sexual development, it makes it much easier to know how to react when you see behaviors that you would like to see changed. Now, going through all of those developmental milestones and markers is just too much information to put here. But I do want to say that in my books, Proactive Parenting on Adolescence, I actually start this process of marking all the development at age six. So because I do find that some adolescents go all the way down to age six or seven in some of their development when we mark them developmentally, particularly related to emotional development and sometimes social. So I've included that age range all the way through adulthood. So if you'd like to know more about how to measure your child's chronological age versus developmental age, please take a look at my book called Proactive Parenting, How to Raise Teens with Values. It's available on my website, proactiveparenting.com. And in that, you'll find a whole section more about the difference between chronological age and developmental age, but more specifically, by age group, you will have information laid out in every area of development, so you can really go through and highlight where your child's at and see where they need support for growth and where you can really kind of encourage them to move ahead. I know it seems like a simple process and we take development as a given. We just think it's going to happen. We feed our child, we make sure that they're safe, clothed, they get sufficient sleep and they're just supposed to go through their developmental process as they should. But I need to really stress that there are layers and layers of connections and behaviors that support their development and you as a parent are an integral part of that. So when you see something happening in your child, it can be really easy to just knee jerk reaction to yell or to correct or to punish. And I understand that because we just figure this child should be doing what they're supposed to. You've said it a million times. And when you find yourself repeating things over and over again and there's no change, it means something's amiss with the development on some level in some area. And so by taking that time to remove one step from the chronological age and delve a bit deeper into the developmental age, it's really easy to identify where your child is behind and where they may be ahead But in the end, it allows you to regulate what you're expecting from your child. You can do things to support the things that are behind to get them back up to speed. And you can support and recognize where they're ahead so they still continue. But you don't make a mistake of expecting too much out of them based on one aspect of their development and failing to recognize that they're actually behind in others. So I encourage you to tap in to this really unharnessed power in parenting by becoming intimately aware of where each of your children is in their development and tweaking your parenting style and approach to address their individual needs that are gonna be modified based on their character and personality and what's going on in your home and in your life. It is the magic mix that's going to change a household that's full of yelling, threats, timeouts, punishments to a household where things start to run smoothly and with less friction. So going back to my to my listener's comment about why is her youngest not going through the development at the same time as her older children, it's because they have a different de- developmental age. Their situation, their character, their personality, their birth order has made it different for them. And 
I encourage every parent, including this listener, to take a look at their child in those different areas of physical, emotional, social, sexual, moral development, intellectual capacity, and figure out where what they're looking for isn't happening and where that setback is at so that you can address that and begin that motion forward. Because as I said before, every kid is going to go through this very predictable path of development, but how they go through that path is individual. So if you see one child being out of sync, it's just because their trajectory is going to be slightly different. But every child is perfect moment to moment in their unique journey. And it's our job as a parent, being wiser, kinder, stronger, bigger, to know that we need to adapt our parenting strategies, become flexible enough to address each individual child's needs so we can get the best out of them and create happy and healthy children. I think that's a pretty good summary about chronological age versus developmental age. I encourage you, if you have any questions about this, do not hesitate to email me at deanna at deannamariemason.com. And you can look for more information about this in my books that are available online at proactiveparenting.com. Also, don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where I continuously post more information about a variety of topics based on the most current science out there. And if you'd like to buy my online courses, they too are available at proactiveparenting.com. I want to thank you for your time and for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, please tell a friend about it. For me, I'm going to close here. I'm Dr. Deanna Marie Mason. I wish you all the best. Take care of and be well, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.